Texas Lutheran University. I'm Tony Sonsi. I'm the chair of the physics department here at TLU, and I just want to welcome everybody to the 2017 SPS lecture in physics. We're really excited. We've had uh, four years of great lectures, and I think tonight's going to be uh, no exception. Um, I'm really proud of our small faculty here at uh, TLU. There are three of us on the faculty and a handful of students who are interested in being connected to a world outside our small campus. Um, they're excited, they're enthusiastic, they work hard, and um, I think they've done a phenomenal job. Not only are they interested in being connected beyond the campus, but they are able to transform a party barn into a science museum in a single day, and then untransform it tonight about 10 o'clock. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our SPS president, who's going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Emily Churchman is the SPS president. She's a junior physics major. Emily, come on up. A junior physics major. Uh, she's one of our outstanding students who was awarded the Rossing Scholarship in Physics, which is an ELCA award this year, and completed REU at Texas A&M University doing nuclear physics um, this past summer. So, Emily, if you'll introduce yourself. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Like she said, I'm Emily and I'm the SPS president here at TLU. And again, I'd like to welcome everybody to our TLU SPS public lecture in physics. Um, I'm honored to be able to introduce to you the distinguished lecturer for the 2017 Family Physics Night, Dr. Francis Slakey. Uh, Dr. Slakey is a professor at Georgetown University and is currently the director of public affairs for the American Physical Society. He earned his bachelor's degree from, the, from Georgetown University and earned his PhD in physics as well from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He specializes in energy and security policy. He is working with SPS chapter, chapters right now on science policy issues. Um, in fact, I just wrote a letter to my congressman last week because he sent some of his coworkers to the APS Division of Nuclear Physics conference that I was in attending, and they were really trying to get undergraduates involved with science policy and everything that's going on right now. Um, Dr. Slakey is a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's a MacArthur Scholar and a Limelson Research Associate for the Smithsonian Institute. Not only is he an accomplished physicist, but he's an amazing and competitive athlete. He's even written a book about some of his adventures called To the Last Breath, which I highly encourage you to read if you haven't done so already. So please help me give a warm welcome to the only man who's ever climbed to the highest point on all seven continents and served all five oceans, Dr. Francis Lakey. So when a publisher first approached me about writing a book, this book, To the Last Breath, uh, they started by asking me a question. They said, what's the arc? And I said, um, well, of course I know what the arc is. Everybody knows what the arc is. I mean, we all know what the arc is, right? This is the arc. And they said, no, 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 not, not that arc. The arc of your life, the story of your life. Ah, oh, that arc. Okay. So this is the arc of my life. So um, you might think that the natural place to start a story um, is at the beginning, right here, but that would be a real mistake in my case because at this point in my life, I was really boring. Right? So instead, my story really starts up here when I was uh, 37 years old. And at that point in my life, I was here. I was climbing El Cap. 3,000 feet, sheer vertical granite in Yosemite Valley, California. And more specifically, actually, when my story starts, I'm about two-thirds the way up. 2,000 feet, straight up off the deck, and I'm in a cot. Um, only when my story starts, um, 
It wasn't seven in the morning when this photo was taken. It was closer to midnight. So what it really looked like was this. And I'm out of balance. I'm hanging dangerously off center, but I am completely oblivious until some dim awareness of the world shakes me awake. And I lift up my head, I look down at my feet, and sure enough, I'm not flat. The cot isn't flat, it's crooked, it's just dangerously crooked. And as my eyes adjust to the dark, I can see the strips of webbing that are holding the cot together, and I can see that one of the strips is unraveling. And I realize that in a few seconds, that strip is going to come completely undone, and the cot is just going to fall out underneath us. And there is nothing I can do to stop that from happening. So I look out over the edge of the cot, down into the void, and I wait for the inevitable. And I fall. I fall. And at some point in all our lives, we will all fall. We will all fall. The question is, what kind of person are we going to become when we get back up? So what I want to do is tell you the kind of person I became when I got back up. But to do that, I first have to tell you a little bit of history, tell you who I was. So um, I first started rock climbing in my teens. I got on a surfboard for the first time in my 20s. And then I realized in my 30s that if I put those two sports together, if I put together climbing and surfing, I could actually be the first at something. I could be the first person to summit the highest mountain in every continent and surf every ocean. I called it the first global surf and turf. And at that point in my life, nothing else mattered but doing that. And then everything changed. Taking that journey changed me. Okay. As a result of doing that, the way I looked at the world changed. The role that I see science has in the world changed. The way I teach completely changed. And I can actually point to the place on the map that started to bend my life. And it was the Himalayas. Or more specifically, it was, it was Everest. So, so let me take you there. So I was heading up Everest, and our expedition went by the Changboche Monastery, which is the home of the most holy Rinpoche of the Kumbu. And the Sherpas who were on our expedition said, well, why don't we stop into the monastery and get a blessing from the Rinpoche? It's going to bring us good luck. So, uh, so I agreed. I said, sure. And I agreed not because I thought the actual blessing was going to bring us good luck. Um, I agreed because I wanted to see the Rinpoche and I wanted to ask him a question. So um, the Rinpoche has staying power. Now, Buddhists believe that he has actually been reincarnated more than six times. He's been alive more than 300 years. So I'm thinking, all right, well, it's not every day you actually get to ask a question to somebody who's been meditating for 300 years, right? And I knew what I wanted to ask him. What's the meaning of life? All right? So, um, so here I am. So there's the Rinpoche right there. And, and this is the moment I'm getting my blessing from the Rinpoche. That's a blessed scarf he's putting around my, leg, my neck, so he blesses me. And so it's right after this moment that I pop the question. So, you know, what's the meaning of life? So he's actually got a translator sitting beside him. And I ask my question, and the translator whispers it to the Rinpoche. And he thinks. And then he whispers back to the translator. And the translator says, are you guys ready for this? Okay, this is the result of 300 years of meditation, okay? 300 years of accumulated wisdom. What's the meaning of life? Rinpoche whispers it to the translator, and the translator says, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got the brush off, right? So, uh, so that night, actually, I'm in my tent. I hear some rustling outside the tent. I unzip the flap, and there's a young monk there, and he's got a bundle, and he hands me the bundle, and it's from the Rinpoche. And I open up the bundle, and inside of it 
there's an amulet. And <clears throat> written on the amulet are these letters. So the next morning, I go to some of the Sherpas, my buddy Pemba, and I show this to him. I said, so, so what does this say? And he says, very, very old writing, uh, powerful, full of life's meaning. I said, Great, but what does it say? And he said, I can't read. I said, what? I said, how can you not read? Who can? He says, nobody. I said, this is very old Tibetan. We can recite it, but we don't know what it means. So what he does do, though, is he, uh, he ties it up and then hands it to me and says, OK, you've got to wear this around your neck and never, ever take it off. OK. So about three weeks later, I'm heading up for the summit of Everest with this around my neck. And we're heading into a storm. And I, uh, and I knew, I knew a blizzard was coming. There's actually a, a movie made about our expedition. And there's a moment in the movie where I actually look at the cameraman and say, I know I'm heading up in the storm. So I knew exactly what I was getting. And there was even this moment when I could have turned around. So I had gotten to uh, what's called the South Summit. So it's a plateau. It's a few hundred feet below the actual summit. And I get to that South Summit, and it's just blizzard conditions by this point, just blizzard. And I'm thinking, ah, weather's bad. Maybe I should turn around. I've been on the mountain for 57 days. I am 300 feet from the summit. I'm thinking, weather's really bad. Maybe I should turn around. So uh, at that moment, the storm blows beneath my feet. So I'm at 28,000 feet. So the blizzard is still there, but the blizzard's below me. It's like I'm standing now on this sea of clouds, and I'm in the sunshine, and I look up, and I see this. And it's the summit, and it is just calling to me. And just so you guys get a sense of scale, that right there, that's a climber. So I decide to push on. Now, I'm on a plateau. So what pushing on means is I got to come down off of that south summit. So I'm standing right here on the south summit. It means I got to come down off the south summit. I got to go back down into the storm. I have to go back down in the storm. But I figured, no problem, right? Because then I'll go across the knife edge and then I'll pop back up on the other side, pop back up into the sunshine, and I'll summit in the sunshine. So I go back down into the storm, and I never see the sun again. So, uh, so yeah, I tagged the summit, but let me tell you what it was like when I got there. Total whiteout conditions. I couldn't see more than 15 feet in any direction, 40 below zero. My oxygen tank was drained, and I was alone. So at that point, I turned around and headed right back down into the teeth of the storm. So it is, it is just slow going. It is three breaths and a step, three breaths and a step, just step, step. So I'm slowly working my way down the ridge line. And I get to about here, and I can just make out three climbers ahead of me in the storm. And they're talking to each other, but I can't hear a word they're saying because the wind is just howling. And then suddenly, one of them sits down, and the other two keep on going. Now, at that altitude, in those conditions, sitting down can only mean one thing. Whoever just sat down has decided to die. So the next eight hours of my life were just complete chaos. But here's the important thing. We all got out of there. 
We all got out of there, every one of us. <clears throat> Nobody left behind frozen into that ridge line at Mount Everest. Which leads to a question. In fact, it was a question I was asking myself when I finally got back down to base. So here I am back down at base. And I'm peeling off gear. I've just gotten back into base camp, and a buddy of mine snapped the photo. You can just see the frostbite on my fingertips. And the question I'm asking myself is, how'd we do it? How'd we all get out of there? Worst storm in recorded history of Everest. We all get out of there. How? And the answer is pretty simple because we cared about the welfare of somebody other than ourselves. We cared about the welfare of somebody other than ourselves. And that's how we started to change. I mean, look, there, there was a time in my life when I would look at a map of the world and all I would see would be places to conquer. I would see mountains to climb, oceans to surf. But after taking that surf and turf journey, I saw something different in every place that I had ever been. So I'm just going to give you one example. Every glacier that I have punched my crampon into is melting. Every one of them. Kehiltna Glacier in Alaska, melting. Glacier in Aconcagua in Argentina, melting. Kilimanjaro, melting. 600 feet of half-mile thick ice has melted away from the Kumbu Glacier since I climbed Everest. So the globe is warming. There's, that's not the only evidence. Every ocean I have ever surfed is rising. So now, now when I look at a map of the world, I don't see places to conquer. I see global challenges. I see global challenges. And I also see people. In fact, let me take a moment and show you how I look at the world now as a physicist who works on global sustainability. And what I want to do, I want to actually put the entire planet on one graph. Okay, I want to put the whole world on a single graph. That, that world I spent 12 years of my life crisscrossing. Let me put the whole thing on this. Okay. So the graph has two axes. Everybody see it? So on one axis, let's put, put GDP, gross domestic product, GDP per capita. And on the other axis, energy use per capita. Now let's take the whole world and put the whole world on this graph. OK, so here's what it looks like down here. Africa. Here. Asia. Here. South America. Right here is Europe. And right here is North America. Whole world on the graph. OK. Only five data points, but that's a really rich data set. In fact, it's pretty suggestive. Um, what does it suggest? Well, it suggests that the more energy you burn, the richer you are. The more energy you burn, the richer you are. The more energy you burn, the richer you are. The more energy you burn, the richer you are. OK, now hold that thought for just a moment. And now let's focus on the one billion people who live down here. Now, I spent a lot of my life traveling in this part of the world, but there are a billion people who live and work in this world every day. I will never have their depth of perspective. I will never have their awareness. But what I can do is tell you what I've seen. And what I have seen is that so many people who live in this part of the world are malnourished. 
They live on $2 a day. They're impoverished. They're unplugged, no electricity, off the grid. At night, they light a kerosene lamp, which is just a wick in a bucket of kerosene. And they're breathing in those noxious fumes just to squeeze a little bit more light out of the darkness. They suffer from diseases. They suffer from malaria and cholera and polio, all things that we've eradicated up here, but they suffer by the millions from it down here. And as a result of all of that, life down here, life down here is short. Life is short. So up here, life expectancy, high 70s, low 80s. Life expectancy down here, low 50s. Life expectancy in Sierra Leone, 44 years old. If I had the misfortune of being born in Sierra Leone, odds are I'd be dead by now. So, in fact, there's somebody that woke up this morning in this part of the world that had to walk five miles just to get clean water. Dust kicking up from their bare feet, walking that hard, that desperately hard path in life. So, so what if, just for a moment, we decide we're going to try to do something that's going to make that path in life just a little bit easier to walk? Okay? Let's suppose we make a modest commitment. Let's suppose we make a modest commitment trying to raise this region of the world up out of poverty. Okay? And I'm, I'm saying modest. I mean, not, not so much that its GDP matches what we've got, not even halfway up. What if we make a commitment to try to just raise the GDP of that part of the world up one third? Okay? And I mean, we make the commitment to help deploy the infrastructure, the road, the electricity, the pumping stations, the clinics, the agriculture to just lift this part of the world out of poverty. Fine. Um, now, I'm a physicist, and this is an energy graph. So it sort of leads to a natural question. How much energy would that take? How much energy would it actually take to do what I just described? How much energy would it actually take to build that infrastructure, build the roads, the clinics, the agricultural development, all of those things that I mentioned. And let's suppose for a moment it's done exactly the same way that we do it here in our country. Same mixture of oil, natural gas, coal, all of that. Let's say it's done exactly the same way. Okay, so there's the question. How much energy would it take to accomplish that goal? And the answer is 160 quadrillion BTUs. You know, what does that mean? Well, again, if it's done exactly the same way as it's done here, it would mean another 5 billion barrels of oil burned every year. It would mean another 120 coal plants. It would mean another 100 natural gas plants. It would mean another 1 billion tons of carbon emissions every year. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Right, so we're supposed to be reducing carbon to limit the effects of climate change. We can't afford to be putting a billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Well, in that case, what do you do? What do we do? Well, one solution is we turn to this part of the world and we just say, oh, sorry guys, you know, sorry, but if we help you out, we risk irreversible environmental damage, and so really, sorry about this, but you know, you're just gonna have to keep suffering down here and take it for the team. Okay, that's not acceptable. But there's another solution, and that is change the paradigm. Stop thinking that the only way to prosperity is by burning more energy. Instead, bend the curve. Find ways to increase economic growth while keeping energy intensity constant. Bend the curve. We've got to find a way to bend the curve. And oh, by the way, not just there, but here and here and here. So we've got to find a way to bend the curve. So 
once I came to this view, um, I decided that I should try to do something about it. So, look, I'm, I'm not a preacher, I'm a physicist, and so it wasn't satisfactory to me to just um, talk about a problem, I wanted to actually solve the problem. So it was at that point in my life that I, um, that I made the stupidest decision of my life. So I figured I wanted to make people aware of global challenges. So what better way to do that than through television? So I figured I would actually audition for a TV show. And I auditioned for not just an ordinary show. I auditioned for this show, Danger Man. This is one of the stupidest decisions in my life. Okay? There's a lot of things wrong with me auditioning for Danger Man. Um, so the problem is um, I admit that adrenaline is my favorite drug, no question about that. But at the same time, uh, I got my limits. Okay? Um, so really, crazed enthusiasm doesn't really describe me. Um, you know, I, I've got my limits, and in fact, let me pause on that for a second. So, you know, I've got my limits. There's things I won't do. I'm guessing all of us are exactly the same way, right? I and mean, we've all got that thing we wouldn't do. We all have the line we would not cross. So, so let's see if we can agree on something, right? What's the line that we can all agree we would never cross? And I'm guessing it's this, right? So I, I am guessing that you wouldn't let someone drive a car over you while you're laying on a bed of nails. Can we all agree on that? Yeah, okay, great. So, so this is something none of us would ever do, I would never do, and I think, okay, I, now I know I've got my limits, there's things I won't do, so with that in mind, I go ahead, I submit my bio to Danger Man. And after four rounds of American Idol-like cuts, I'm selected to go to Hollywood and film the pilot. So off I go to Hollywood. And, uh, and I'm, in, uh, I'm in the soundstage and we're filming the pilot. And I'm doing some, some dopey stunt or other that Danger Man's supposed to be doing. And I look up while I'm doing the stunt and I look at the cameraman and he's yawning. And the sound man is you know, punching something into his phone and I realize, this is boring. This is, this, is really, this is really boring. And the director realizes that at about the same time. So he's a cut, he says cut, he comes up to me and says, this, this, this is boring, this is boring, this isn't working. We gotta change this up. And then he starts thinking on the fly. Very dangerous thing for a director of Hollywood to be doing. So he starts thinking on the fly and says, okay, look, so you're doing this stunt. I here's what we'll do. Yes, we'll do this stunt, but then what we're going to do throughout the half hour of the, of the episode is we're going to just start cranking up the intensity. Like the next stunt you do is more intense, and then the next one's more intense, and the next one's more intense. And we're going we're gonna to end with a stunt that is so intense, so over the top, that everybody's going to be talking about it the next day. And he's got a vision for what that stunt should be, and he tells me this. So I say no, <laughs> and, uh, and I left the soundstage, and I realized Hollywood is not for me, right? I went back home, and I went back to the drawing board, literally the, the drawing board. I went back and, and reminded myself of this, and I looked back at this, and I thought, come on, man, this, I don't need to go to Hollywood to do this, right? I should be making a commitment myself to try to bend that curve, to try to make the associated carbon reductions to help bend that curve. I should be doing that. Fine. So I had to make a pledge. I said, okay, what's a reasonable amount? What could I pledge to? What kind of reductions could I pledge to? Carbon reductions could I pledge to? So what about I pledge to reduce emissions by 10 tons over 10 years? That's a ton of emissions a year. Ah, uh, that's weak. That's weak. All right. What if I pledge to reduce emissions by 100 tons over 10 years? No, you're nodding that off. That's too, still too weak. Okay, what about this? What if I pledge to reduce emissions by 600,000 tons 
over just three years. Okay, now we're talking, now we're talking. Sounds crazy, right? I did it, okay? So I did it through the Georgetown University Energy Prize. So it was a nationwide energy efficiency competition. We opened it up to uh, cities with populations no more than 250,000, and they competed to see which was the most energy efficient, which one would lead the way in energy efficiency. We recently announced the top 10. The winner is going to be announced at the end of the year. That'll be the community in the United States that leads the way in energy efficiency, and there's 50 competing communities. Um, it's a data-driven competition. One nice thing about a data-driven competition is you can actually see the results. They're real, they're verifiable. You can see the results come in. And as of a month ago, the 50 competing communities had saved $115 million and they had cut emissions by 590,000 tons. Um, but those are just numbers. Let me talk about the people. In fact, let me talk about one in particular, Alejandro Barón. So Alejandro is um, an at-risk youth living in Holland, Michigan. He has had trouble at school. Uh, he's been in and out of the juvenile justice system. And in a community that has a lot of gang violence, he is prime recruiting for gangs. So the city knows all this. The city of Holland, Michigan knows this. And so the way they've gone about trying to address the problem, what they had done was they would just arrest gang leaders. And in fact, they were arresting gang leaders at a rate of about 30 gang leaders per year. And they were seeing no drop in juvenile crime, none. And the reason is because the gangs were recruiting as fast as the city was arresting. So what do you do? What do you do with a problem like that? Or more importantly, maybe you're thinking, what does any of this have to do with energy efficiency? Well, um, Holland, Michigan applied to get into the Georgetown University Energy Prize. And they had a wild idea. And we let them in. And they did it. And what it was is they, took, they decided they would take at-risk youths, they would train them in energy efficiency, and they would have them knock on doors of homeowners and tell them how they could make their home more energy efficient. And so their first round of recruits, one of the people they recruited, Alejandro Barone. So they deploy those 20. It works. So they recruit another 20. It works. They recruit another 20. As a result of the program, juvenile crime in Holland, Michigan, has dropped 45%. As a result of an energy efficiency program, Juvenile crime has dropped 45%. Okay? And the reason I'm saying this is when you work in energy programs, it's really easy to get caught up in the big numbers. You know, gigatons of emissions, quadrillions of BTUs, gigawatts of power. And it's really easy to get caught up in those big numbers, but sometimes it's worth putting a pause on all of that and thinking about the people behind the numbers, people like Alejandro Barone. You do that and you recognize the truly transformative power of energy programs. So change, change doesn't just happen with big national programs. Change can also happen in the classroom. And I had told you that taking that journey had changed you know, the way I look at the world, the role that I see that science has in the world, but I also said it changed my teaching. So let me talk a little bit about that too. So um, I used to be classic old school physics professor, just back to the class, chalk in my hand, and I would just scribble away at the chalkboard for 50 minutes straight. The only person talking was me, and the students would just sit back and take notes. I don't do that anymore. Now, face forward, face forward. Students break into groups. They identify some social challenge out there that nags at them. The more it nags at them, the better. They develop a solution to that problem, and then they get off campus and they do something about it. So let me give you examples of a couple student projects so you get a feel for how this works. So one of the groups was concerned about 
invasive species. And great, big, colossal, global problem. First thing I have them do is localize it, all right? So what's, what is the local manifestation of that problem? And where I'm from in Washington, D.C., the local manifestation of it is a snakehead fish, which has invaded the Chesapeake watershed, and it's, um, it's an assault on the natural habitat. Fine, so snakehead fish. So what to do about it? Their idea was they wanted to raise awareness for it, but more importantly, encourage people to, to go after that fish. And so what they did is they came up with, I don't know what to describe, a manifesto, a, a guidebook. Um, so it, they called it the invasive hit list. And they treat you like you're a hit man. And it tells you how to hunt down that fish, hook it, cook it, go after that thing, take it down. Right? This thing is sassy, it's clever, and importantly, they vetted this thing with conservation biologists, so all the science is absolutely accurate, but it is so readable, and it's a page turner. Anyway, fine. So they hand me this thing, fantastic. So what? I mean, what difference does this make if nobody actually reads this? Okay? If you want to address the problem, you've got to have distribution. You've got to get this thing out there. So. Oh, by the way, one other feature of this is, um, of course, since you know, they're encouraging people to take it with them when they go fishing, it's crumple-proof. And to prove to me how rugged it was, this mine, mine here was soaked in water for 48 hours, so it's waterproof, too. So, so great. What do you do? So they went to the Department of the Interior, and they presented this thing to the Department of the Interior. Now, the Department of the Interior um, already has something on invasive species. Here it is and uh, invasives, and it's the you know, typical three-page trifold thing, and it talks about it. Um, well, uh, the Department of the Interior, over the next two years, will be replacing every one of these in every park in the country with these. So they sold thousands of these to the Department of the Interior. After that, they started their own company, FM31, and uh, now they're doing more volumes on more invasive species. Great. So let me tell you about another student project. Um, the students were interested in marine debris, very concerned about marine debris. Again, colossal problem. Make it local. What's the local manifestation of the problem? And in D.C., uh, we have two rivers. We got the Anacostia and the Potomac, and so they went out and measured uh, the, the content in the water. Turns out there's microfibers in plastics in our local waterways. And a primary source of those uh, microfibers is when you wash your fleece in your washing machine, it, uh, in the affluent, the microfibers from the fleece get out into the waterways. Okay. So they came up with a very elegant solution. And the solution was a, a, a bag that you could put your fleece in and wash it. And the holes in the bag had pores that were big enough to let the soap in, but they were small enough to trap the microfibers. So after this thing gets out of the washing, you can just shake out the collected fibers into recycling. Great, really clever. Um, only they weren't interested in having a business. They didn't want to have a business. Instead, what they wanted to do is they wanted some other company out there to realize that they could, if the students could come up with something, you know, in a basement using washing machines, they could come up with a solution. Well, then Patagonia ought to be able to come up with a solution, or Columbia ought to be able to come up with a solution. So what they really wanted to do is create a movement and get other uh, companies to take this on and do something about the problem. Fine. How do you create a movement? Well, um, by creating a viral video. Well, how do you do that? All right, so now they're in a world they're not even familiar with. Well, what they did is they reached out to a guy named Ben Von Wong, who's a photographer. And, uh, and what he does, he comes, he takes a picture, but he makes a video of how he takes the picture. And that tends to go viral. So they talked to Ben. He thought this was fascinating. He came to campus and filmed the students on the project. So the, the video isn't final yet, but I could show you um, a, a draft version of it. So here we go. Let's take a look. Before Ben walked into this room, 
This was a standard biology lab. Now you look at it. It's gotten to the point where I'm not sure you can find something that should be in a biology lab. What's tricky about this problem is you can't see it. The idea of the monster around your bed that isn't there, but the monster in your washing machine that is. It's a problem that's going to have to be addressed sooner or later. Why not be the first? So those two projects I told you about are, um, they aren't unique. It's pretty typical. In fact, students um, over the last several years since I've been teaching this way, they have um, four have started their own companies. Uh, one is patenting their uh, product. Um, they don't always choose to do things on their own. Some have worked with major corporations on ideas. Uh, sometimes they choose a science policy route. So I've had four student groups actually draft legislation that was eventually passed by Congress, signed into law by the president. Um, and, a, and a reason I'm saying all this is there's no magic in my classroom. It's not like I sprinkle pixie dust over the students they can suddenly do this kind of thing. No. Um, what I've learned is that when a physics major, a science major, a student, any of you get inspired by a sense of social purpose, you can build a better world. I've seen it happen. So, so I came a long way in my journey. You know, I told you about, I started by telling you about the global surf and turf. Um, so yeah, I completed it. In fact, I completed it here. Um, surfing the Arctic Ocean in Vestvagoy Island, Norway. I finally checked that last box. Um, and when I was walking out of the surf, water dripping off my wetsuit into that Arctic sand, um, suddenly so many pieces of my journey fell into place. In particular, you remember this? So I had been trying to decode that amulet for years. So I took it to Tibetan scholars. I took it to linguists. I took it to the language department of the Library of Congress. Nobody could decode this thing. But when I was sitting on that beach in Norway, um, it suddenly all became so clear. So, so let me share it with you. Um, I have had the good fortune in my life to stand on the highest rock of every continent and surf the waves of every ocean. And, and this is what I've learned. The universe is clothed in formulas. In fact, as a physicist, I've dedicated my life to trying to uncover those formulas. But while the universe is clothed in formulas, it speaks in stories, and we have to be mindful of the words. There is warmth and humor, tragedy and heroism, frailty and challenge in the stories of the world. But there is always a way to participate, to restore a torn page, to shape the story, and if necessary, with enough will, by pushing, pushing to the last breath, you can steer that story towards something better. So that was my journey. This is your journey. Help steer it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Slakey. Um, does anybody have any questions? Don't be shy. Yeah. Daniel? So you said you started this when you were like 30, 37? Yeah, that's right. Did you feel like you were going before then? What Wow, that's a great question. So, um, so I was studying physics. And I pretty much found my way into physics because uh, it was just something I could do. And I, I came to love it. But even though I was doing it, I was still nagged by all of the, uh, all the sports that I was doing. And so sports were still front and center for me. And, and when I came up with this notion of piecing these two sports together and being the first at something, being the first at something became the obsession. 
So I, I have to confess that was a time in my life when I didn't care as much about physics as I should have. I did, I did. So that night, um, my buddy and I, so there was actually two of us on that cot. So we, we laced in uh, as a safety. I mean, cots, the odds of a cot collapsing gotta be one in a million, it just doesn't happen, right? I mean, you can be absolutely trusting of the cot. Um, but that night we clipped in anyway, so I had a safety line attached to, uh, to the rope. And so the cot fell, all our gear fell, I fell, fell about 15 feet until the rope caught. And then it was a matter of trying to get somewhere in the dark with no gear. But that's how I got through it. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so one of them was really interesting. It was um, a, care, a, a care box that could be uh, deployed on campus. It was really interesting. So in the same way that you could call, do you guys have like a, um, uh, uh, like a grocery delivery service here? You guys can do that? Yeah, so theirs was this care box. If you get a cold, don't go to class, stay in, your, stay in your room, don't spread the germs around, and instead you can actually call. And so they came up with not only the care box, but the whole app system to make it happen. I thought that was a, a pretty clever one that they worked on. Yeah. Yeah, tell me. So, uh, so I, I told you what I did with my, uh, with my project, which helps bend the curve up here, okay? Um, fine, so things can be done to actually bend the curve up here. You know, this, the challenges exist down here, right? And I think probably the most important thing I realized in all of this is that we have to stop thinking that the way it's done down here has to be the way it's done up here, right? So suddenly what's available down here is uh, distributed generation, Solar power, you know, there's a lot of par those parts of the world that can have uh, off-grid distributed generation, if you guys are familiar with that, so it's just sort of rooftop solar. Um, solar's at a point now where it can generate enough to, to, to provide some of the basics, and it's amazing what, what one requirement, one demand is in that part of the world is charge your cell phone. Charge your cell phone. Number two, refrigerator. We're getting to a point now where rooftop solar could actually power refrigerators. So you're starting to get sort of basic necessities um, able to be addressed through distributed generation, which means much different way about thinking about power, which is no grid, no big, you know, um, country-wide or even uh, regional-wide grid. Instead, you can have a lot more uh, just distributed generation. And that it would be a significant breakthrough in bending the curve. Yeah? So what gives you the most hope as you work towards the new? You know, uh, it's what I've seen in the classroom, Josh, right? So it's. It, the, the generation that's coming up now, you know, I, I had thought when I started teaching this way that I would have to spend the first couple weeks, first few weeks of the semester introducing students to the global challenges, maybe even give, it, give them some to work on. No. You guys are all fully aware of what the problems are in the world. That's what I've realized. And, uh, and as I've seen the opportunity, to, all I do is just give them the opportunity to run with their ideas, right? I just try to clear the path take the obstacles out of the way and let them run with their ideas. And, and seeing what, that, uh, what your generation is capable of doing is what gives me so much hope. Yeah. I'll start with something you care about. So, you know, I said that the students in my class, what I, what I encourage them to do, I've stopped giving them ideas. They choose their own ideas to work on. 
And I say, just pick a challenge that nags at you. And really, pick something that bothers you out there in the world. The more it bothers you, the more motivated you're going to be to solve it. And, and the other thing I learned in teaching the class this way is that when I let the students come up with their own ideas, they're more, much more personally invested in it and much more concerned about the outcomes. And it ends up being all absorbing um, at the expense of other classes that they're taking. But in your case, start that same way. You know, what are the things that bother you? And you'll be able to find like-minded people who are equally concerned about the problem because you're not going to be able to address it alone. But once you've identified what it is you want to work on and you find others who share the same concern, you go from there. But that's the first step. So my class is a semester long. And so by the end of the semester, they can decide to continue if they want. And Georgetown has been great about that. They created a whole new track for students so that if, they, if their project actually takes off and if they want to continue, they can continue to do it for credit out of the classroom the next semester. And so the two that I mentioned both chose that, and a number of groups do. So once they start seeing that they got traction, they got somebody interested, um, maybe they're starting their own company, then they continue it for another semester, get credit, and then by then, they've, um, the path is clear. Some of them graduate and continue to develop their idea. Another question over here? Yeah. Do I believe in aliens? If you, can I rephrase your question? Do I believe that there is life outside of our solar system? The odds are overwhelmingly yes. That was easier than I thought. OK, yeah. <laughs> so I've gotten committed to this. So climate change has been personally the, the issue that I have um, dedicated the majority of my professional time to addressing. But there's certainly plenty to choose from. But that's the one. And you know, I, I try to work something that um, allows me to use my physics expertise. And so that also defines the area. As it, it might have been clear from, um, from my talk, some of the students that I described are biology majors who find their way into my class. And so they might choose something in, on endangered species, on marine debris. So I have a, uh, it's one, one really fulfilling thing about the class is to see just how many uh, interests the students have. And there's a broad range of problems that they work on. So, you know, uh, I've, got, I've got my answer. I think my brothers would probably come up with some, some other answer. But they always thought that I was trying to compete with them and show them that I was better than they were. So they started climbing first, and then I started climbing. I think I chose climbing just because it's a phenomenal sport, right? Um, they think I did it just to try to show them I was a better climber than they were. But brotherly competition, you know where that leads. But, um, but that's how I got drawn in. So they did it first. I, I did it too. No, no, I, I don't provide financing for them, right? So they've done various things. So they've done Kickstarters to try to get some support. Um, they've, uh, they've asked the university on the side. There's a student fund that they can try to tap to get support. Uh, when they work with other companies, the companies can take an interest, and they've provided the support. So it's a variety of ways. But, but I, I leave that to them to find a way to get the, the, uh, the finances they need to get it going. I think I probably overtrained. It was crazy the kind of training that I would do. And I'm saying that just because my knees are killing me. <laughs> so I've switched sports entirely now so that, that, uh, so that my body can recover. So I don't do any climbing or surfing anymore. But back then, it was um, trying, to, trying to make a mountain out of a gym, right? So I can't get to a mountain every week to train. I was living in DC. And so I would just train in a gym, weights, Stairmaster, and then um, you know, 
try to simulate mountains. Yeah. Well, it depends on where you're living, right? So if you're in the Maldives, it's already a problem, right? So you're, you know, they're, they're now pumping out houses. They're trying to dig trenches. I mean, they're seeing basically their country go away. So is it urgent? If, you're, if you live there, it is. It's immediate. The problem is now. Um, you know, if you're in Florida, if you're in Miami, you're starting to see flooding on a more regular basis than you had before. When, and, and, uh, and so there's regions of the U.S. that are starting to see it with more intensity. But look, it's, it's a gradual increase, right? And so you can try to persuade yourself that, well, we can just accommodate this over time. But if you run the numbers, you see accommodating it over time doesn't work, particularly if you're in these island nations, which are already suffering. So we have time for one more question. And I saw a hand back there. Yeah. Well, f first I got to say it was not, I did not have a road to Damascus moment, right? I mean, I, I had a big change on Everest. You know, living through that experience made a big difference. But then that was amplified in the trip I took to Antarctica and, uh, and, and other places along the way. I, I dodged an ambush in Indonesia. So, I mean, all of these things sort of over time just contributed a complete change in perspective. And the results are uh, the classroom, right? So the way I teach was a profound change. My concern for the world uh, couldn't be any more different now. I mean, I, I was pretty um, self, I was, I was just self-absorbed. So if you want a single change from self-absorbed to caring about the world, I think is the biggest change that I've undergone. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Slakey. Thank you, everyone. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.